Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's time to start. I want to welcome you to the Port Orchard Church of Christ. When Paul was in Athens, he was trying to introduce those people who were serving an unknown God that they knew nothing about. And he introduced them to the God that he served. This is some of what he said. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. That's the God we serve. <clears throat> Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Let heaven and earth his praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin away. In his heart, sweet music may and sing with us for Jesus' sake that God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God. for me. 
Our scripture reading this morning is going to come from a letter of Ephesians. We're we'll reading from the fourth chapter, verses one through. <coughs> oh, it's so hard to get stopping point sometimes. Uh, we're going to read through thirteen. Again, Ephesians chapter four, verses one through thirteen. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us grace was given, according to the measure of God, Christ's gift. Therefore it says, he who ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> Amen. Mm -hmm. 
give us the confidence that you're here with us today, but just with us during the week, Lord. We need you in our life. We need you so desperately right now. There are so many of us that are going through maybe some hidden struggles that we're just not sharing openly, just not able and willing to, to voice. But Lord, you know our struggles. You know what's going on in our life daily, whether it's at work, whether it's decisions we're making, whether it's family, you know, with health decisions and and we're just, we're human. We're human. You've created us. But you've given us the string that becomes a bond that's stronger than the string. And that's through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we need you. We need Jesus in our life. Please hear our plea. Please hear our, our struggles. Give us some peace. Give us some guidance. Help us to know that this life that we live is, is a struggle. It's not supposed to be heaven on earth. But we're supposed to be focused on you and having our eyes turned to you, looking for your guidance and your strength. And you know, and the, the beauty that you've created with us individually is, is through the blood of Christ. And with that blood of Christ, we're a family through that blood. And it's through that blood that we can share with each other our burdens and our struggles. <clears throat> Help us to know that we're not in this battle alone. We have friends and family here and across the world. Friends that we've developed that have gone on and, 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 and done other things, but they're just a phone call away if we really need to reach out. But we're also here in Port Orchard. Lord, help us to also rely on each other because it's through you that, that we can bond and we can share our struggles. So we ask that you help us to not forget the bond. Lord, I just pray that you be with Trent this morning as he as he brings us his, his words of, of what he's done with you this week in this quiet time. Help him to, to know that, that you're sharing his words with us. May we all be have open ears to what he's sharing with us and, and apply that to our lives and, and take it out and, and share that with others this week, Lord, as we we strive to please you. Lord, we, we implore that you help us to somehow take the next step with this church, Lord. Help us to know which direction you want us to go. Make it so evident that, that we're not guessing and, and that we're all on one page. Help us to be united, as has been shared in, in prior Sundays. Help us to be united in your word and your, in your, in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for those that are, that are sick, those that are recovering. Um, this COVID thing is, is just such a mystery, Lord, and I just pray that, that you will help those that are sick, whether it's the flu or the sniffles or, or having other serious uh, situations, um, whether it's dementia or um, heart problems. Lord, you can heal us all. That's the magic of, not magic, that's a, a very poor word. That is the power of who you are. We believe in you, Lord. We know that you can heal us. And if it's not a healing of the physical, then help us to be spiritually healed, to know that you're not going to forsake us, that you will be there tomorrow and the next day and the next day. We just need to open our eyes and know that you're there. Help us in our times of need. Help us in our times of weakness because we're human and we need you in our lives. Lord, I just pray that you help us to have a good day of worshiping you today. We love you. We want to be in your presence today, Lord. Help us to, to be humble, but also to be worshiping with all of our hearts, because we do love you. And we thank you for the sacrifice that your son gave us, the sacrifice that you made on that day of, of separation from your son that day, Lord. It's just, it strikes me as something I just don't, will ever understand that you separated yourself from your son that day. Why? Because you loved us so. Help us to return that love. And if it's love from each individually to you, then so be it. But Lord, we want to share that love with others in this community to fill our, to fill our walls again with, with just praise and honor to you. So help us, show us the way. Forgive us, Lord, when we fall short. 
Help us to rely on each other and help us to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Supper, this Last Supper, for him, uh, and he told the the disciples that were with him, "Whenever you do this, remember me." He didn't specify what to remember about Jesus. He specified, "Remember me," and that's what I want us to do this morning. Um, there's a passage that's <coughs> taken from Matthew, the eleventh chapter. And in this chapter, we find that John the Baptist is in prison, and his disciples are nearby. But Jesus is in Galilee teaching and preaching and, and doing a lot of different miracles. And John, being in prison, didn't hear everything about what was going on with Jesus. So he told his disciples to go find out what Jesus is doing and ask him, is he the one? I wish she would be looking for somebody else. So his disciples went and they they relayed that message to Jesus, and Jesus said, "Go back and tell John what you've seen, what you've heard. The blind can see, 
The deaf can hear. The lame can walk. The lepers have been cleansed. The dead have been raised. All of these things. Go back to tell John. <clears throat> and then, as John's disciples left to go back to John, uh, Jesus turned his attention to the cities around him in Galilee, uh, the different cities that he had been to and done these miracles. And they were not willing to repent. And Jesus said, you know, if these miracles were done a long time ago, the ancient part, ancient times, they would have repented. If, if they saw these miracles in Sodom, that city would still be here. And then he talks to the, the ones who, who lived in those cities. And this is the familiar part of the story, is, is that Jesus talked to them and he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And we all know what a, a yoke is. We've seen it in the, in the Frontier movies and things. It's this big wooden thing they put around the neck and shoulders of, a, of an ox to pull a load you know, plow a field or, or whatever they needed. And there was, there was two reasons for that. One of them was so that they could carry a much larger load, of course. It's the obvious one. But it was also so that the inexperienced ox could learn from the experienced one. And so Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So, in this passage, Jesus is saying, you know, step up to me. Strap yourself to me. Learn from me you'll have rest for your souls. That to me is a, an awesome passage of scripture. Um, and so as, as we remember Jesus, we remember his death on the cross, of course, we remember his resurrection, we remember all of this that Jesus wanted us to remember about him. Um, but we need to know that it's, it's more than just him dying on a cross and forgiving our sins. Which is what happened on the cross, because he shed his blood for all of us. And that's what this bread and the, and the juice is to us. It's a representation of Jesus' body and blood that he so willingly gave to us, gave for us. But it's also a remembrance of him when he was teaching the people and trying his best, you know, this, this, uh, I don't know if it's final, but this last request was to just come to me and, and, and you'll receive rest, I want to help you. So as you're taking this bread and this, and this juice, would you just remember Jesus? Whatever you want to remember about him. There's a lot. The Bible says that the world couldn't hold all the books of it, all the things that Jesus has done. But just remember Jesus. And take this, just a short amount of time here just to think about him. Think about the cross if you want. Think about his life. Think about <coughs> Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made. His life, his teachings, his miracles, his, his proving himself to the world. 
and that the world really did accept him. We're thankful that he did that for us. Would you help us to remember him right now as we take this bread and take this juice? Father, we honor you in this because you sent Jesus, and we honor him because he was willing to sacrifice for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. It is time for Children's Church, and so if you qualify as a child, and your parents are okay with that, you can head downstairs with Miss Laura, and have a good time, would you?
Good morning again. Good morning. You know, you'd think after you came up here so many times, the, the nerves would go away, but, you know, they just never do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we, uh, we serve an awesome God, don't we? Yeah. A God who redeems, a God who loves us, um, a God who calls us when we were yet sinners. He calls us into something greater. Um, and we need our Savior, don't we? We do. Yes. I do. Uh, more and more I realize just how much I need him. And uh, <clears throat> today's lesson, I want to talk about, or start talking about the church. How many of you, uh, by our show of hands, are married? Married, have been married? Okay, good. Most of us. Um, if, <clears throat> if someone started to speak disparagingly against your spouse. How would that make you feel? Angry. Angry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> How many times have we <clears throat> spoke disparagingly of the church? <clears throat> How many times have we said not nice things about the church? <clears throat> The church is the bride of Christ. Most of you probably know that. But I think sometimes we forget that. And so I want you to think of what your reaction would be when someone speaks about your spouse, how Jesus might feel when we speak about his spouse. When we work against the unity of the church, when we speak against members of the church, we are called into unity. We are called into oneness. And Paul in the Ephesians letter um, really does a great job. Ephesians is the most, or the letter that speaks the most about the church. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit just about the background of Ephesians. Um, Ephesians, the city of Ephesus, was the religious, uh, religiously like Rome, but it was commercially like New York. It was a city that was bustling with activity. It was a port city, but there were also highways that interchanged all through the area. It was located in what is now Western Turkey, and it was a hub of activity. When Paul goes there, we learn about in Acts 18, 19, and it mentions it also in 20. Paul spends time there. He preaches in the synagogue. He, he teaches in the school of trials. He, he, from there, spreads the gospel to what is known all of Asia Minor. And the people in Ephesus were... Worshippers of the mother goddess. They were, it was believed that she was born there. And we know her as Diana or as Artemis, when we see in, 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 in Acts as it's reported. <clears throat> they would make statues and, and figurines. And, and Paul runs into some trouble with some of the silversmiths because of his teaching. And so many people were starting to follow after Christ that it was causing a disruption in their commercial activity. And so... Um, a riot ensues and they take Paul and all that. If you want to know more, I encourage you to go read the latter part of Acts. But Paul writes this letter to the Ephesian church. It's written at the same time that he writes the letter to Colossae, or to Colossians, the letter of Colossians, and also Philemon. See, um, uh, Tetricus, who was preaching in Colossae, made the trip from Colossae all the way to Rome, because at this time, Paul is in a Roman prison when he writes these letters. Tetricus makes his way all the way to Rome to meet with him, to share with him the struggle that he's having in Colossae. And so Paul sits down and he pens the letter to Colossians, or the letter of Colossians, and also the letter to Ephesians. If you take the two letters and bring them together, there is a lot of similarities between the two. 
In, Ephes in, in Ephesians, we see the glorious church, Paul teaching on the church. The first three chapters are, are doctrinal issues of the church. The latter chapters are the exhortation or the encouragement to us to fulfill and to live out those doctrines. He also, when he sends Tetricus back with these letters, he sends a gentleman named Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave who had run away, and Paul meets him in Rome, converts him to Christianity, and sends him back with Tetricus to Philemon. That's another letter that we have in the New Testament. Philemon was a member of the church in Colossae, and it was where in his home where they would meet. And he sends Onesimus back with this letter to Philemon. And I find it interesting just how connected a lot of these letters are. And when we sit down, we often break them up and we, we look at little parts and pieces of them. But everything is so interwoven and connected that sometimes we forget that. And I want to encourage you just this morning in just this little brief introduction to just be amazed at how we are given this document that shows us people's lives that shows us people's position so that we can date things, we can know. This is a historical record that we can look back at and see. These were real men. These were real people working for God. Paul writes in his letter about the church. The church is mentioned nine times in this epistle. The word body is mentioned another nine times. Chapter 4 begins with, therefore. Now, whenever you see therefore, you ought to ask yourself, wherefore? Therefore is like a because or since. So, as Paul starts chapter 4, this is the, the section that starts into the exhortation after the doctrine on the first three chapters. Paul says, therefore. So, because of the first three chapters, because of what I have just told you, this is what you ought to do. This is how you ought to live. I want to just for a moment go back and look at some of those things from chapter 3. So, because God revealed the mystery, chapter 3, verse 3. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insights into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ through the gospel. We are reminded, and because of the manifold wisdom of God, verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was the, in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Finally, starting in verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in, our, in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to com comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory of the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So because of that, I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord, remember Paul is in prison in Rome right now as he's writing this letter. I, Paul, prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called. To implore is to, is to beg almost, to, to, to adamantly ask. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy. The word worthy there is the idea of, of equal weights. That there's a balance. That there's an equal value. So that our lives ought to be an equal value to the calling which we have been given. And if it's not, why not? 
What do we need to change to equal out the weights? Remember those old weights with the, the, the arms and the little pedestals that would hang down and you'd put some on here and it would balance out? Our lives ought to be a balance to the worthiness of the call in which we have been called. <clears throat> our calling is our mission, our vocation. We are called to be laborers in the vineyard. We are called to be messengers of the gospel. We are called to live a life that demonstrates our belief in our God. As Paul starts to write in chapter 4 in this exhortation, in other words, this, this urging of how we ought to behave, he says that you ought, to, you, act, you ought to walk in this manner that is worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In verse 2 he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. How do we walk worthy of the calling? Paul explains it to us. It's by acting humbly, to humble ourselves to one another. We humble ourselves before our Lord, but how often do we humble ourselves before each other? Rather, how often do we say, my way, I want it my way. I want things done the way I want them. We are called to be a people of humility. Christ humbled himself, Philippians chapter 2, by becoming a man, by giving up the glory of heaven to walk as a man. And then he even humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. If Christ can do that, then we ought to be able to humble ourselves to each other, right? Because we are a therefore religion. Therefore, because what a Christ has done for us, we ought to dot, dot, dot. Not that it's a balance that we have this obligation to check boxes to be good enough. Because it's God's grace that covers us. But because of the love that God showed to us, we ought to show love to others. So because God loved us, therefore we love others. Because God showed us forgiveness and mercy, therefore we show forgiveness and mercy. But not only are we to be humble, we are to be gentle. I like the King James, the meekness. Meekness does not mean weakness. <clears throat> I want to say that again. Meekness does not mean weakness. Meekness is the idea of power restrained. I imagine a horse. Many of you probably are familiar with horses. They're a very strong animal. But their power is restrained when we bridle them, when we saddle them. That's meekness. Power to do whatever you want, but you are restrained and you restrain that power. So we are to be humble. We are to be meek or gentle. This is a tough one with patience. I don't know about you guys, but I, I struggle with patience. <clears throat> Sometimes I just want things the way I want them, and I want them now, right? Have it your way, Burger King. <clears throat> patience is one of those things that we have to work towards. Remember last week we talked about disciplining ourselves? We have to not only work on our spiritual disciplines, but we have to work on our disciplines just in our own nature. So that if we are going to be worthy of the calling for which we have been called, we have to be humble. We have to be meek or gentle, but we have to do it with patience. So when a brother or sister isn't seeing eye to eye with us, we don't immediately rise to anger or quarrelsomeness. We use patience. And in gentleness, we humble ourselves before our brother or our sister. Not only that, but we have to have tolerance. We have to tolerate each other. <laughs> Sometimes that can be difficult. But we are called to tolerate, to tolerance. That means that even though we don't agree, even though there might be something, we are okay being together. We are okay being in the same setting because we are bound together by something greater than us. Amen. So that tolerance is something that we allow ourselves to partake 
end. So we are humble, we are meek, we use patience, we show tolerance for one another in what? Love. In love. Christ loved us, so we ought to love each other, right? We are bound by love. Paul says that love is the greatest, faith, hope, and love. Love is the, the binding agent of those. But he says in verse 3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So to be diligent is to be dedicated, to be thoughtful, to lay out methodically what you are going to do. To preserve, to hold on to, to make a, a lasting, a lasting, um, thinking of those jars of fruit, food that my grandma used to make in the pantry, and they used to have them in the fruit room. Preserve? They were preserved. Preserves. Preserves! That's the word I meant. <laughs> tell you, you get nervous up here sometimes. Though we, um, we are diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. A bond is something that holds things together. Uh, there's one definition. A bond is a pattern of specifically laying bricks so that it builds up the structure of the building or the structure. I like that one. Because when we think about, when we think about peace being the bond that holds us together, and we think about it being laid in such a way that it, it weaves the blocks, the pieces together, that it holds them together so that the structure is stronger. Do you know that we are living blocks? Christ is our cornerstone. We are being built up as living blocks into the temple of God. The church is the people, the building blocks built and held together by the bond of peace. Paul will go on to say next of the seven ones. The one things that, that actually bind us together, the things that, that hold us together, all wrapped and tied together by peace. Because peace is the one thing that has to hold us all together. It reads, now I want to say this in verse 4. Um, many of you in your Bibles, if you're reading along, may have there is in italicis. What that means is that that is not in the original manuscripts. That was added by the translators to make the reading a little bit easier. And sometimes it does make the flow a little bit easier, but sometimes it kind of changes the way we read it. I want to read it once with it, and then I want to read it once without. I'm going to start in verse 3. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit just as you also were called in one hope of your calling. Verse 3 again. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. Do you see the difference? The bond of peace envelops one body. That one body is the church. Do you know that Christ, in his ministry, spoke and preached about the coming kingdom? About his rule, his reign, his authority. In, in the Greek, in the original language, there's two different words for kingdom. One means an earthly kingdom, an, an area that is, is, is sectioned off. This is their kingdom. The other is the idea of the authority. The kingly authority, the rule, the reign. And more often, Jesus speaks about the rule and the reign and the authority. Because the kingdom that Jesus was coming to establish was not an earthly kingdom. It was a heavenly kingdom. It was a kingdom that enveloped his church and his people. We are one body. Paul will often use the imagery of a body to talk about the church. 
How we are many parts and pieces and we are all held together. We can't all be hands. We can't all be eyes, right? The many pieces and the parts work together to form the body and then the body moves because of its many pieces and parts. If we were all hands, we wouldn't really get very far, would we? There is one body and one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope. That hope is Christ. Our hope is laid in Christ. That the promises that he made to us, we have faith and hope that those are going to be true. Right? His resurrection from the dead is the linchpin which holds everything together. Paul will say that if, it did, if the resurrection didn't take place, then we of all men ought to be pitied. Because everything that we believe is a lie. But we hope. Hope means a confident expectation. We have one hope, and that is Christ. Our hope isn't in our stuff. It's not in our homes. It's not in this world. If it is, then we are doomed for failure and disappointment. Our hope is in Christ. One hope of your calling. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We have one Lord, we have God, and Jesus is our Lord. We have one faith, it's the faith, the faith of the gospel, the message that rings true. There's one baptism. Now nowadays, the word baptism has been changed. The definition has been expanded. In Paul's day, when they spoke of baptism, baptismo, it meant full immersion. That's what the word actually means, to be immersed. There's other words for dipping and sprinkling. Those words are never used in scripture to talk about baptism. And in fact, it wasn't until about two, 251, I think, when the first recorded sprinkling or pouring of water takes place. So there's one baptism. It's not the baptism by the Holy Spirit. We only see examples of that twice, when the Holy Spirit is baptized on the apostles, and then about ten years later when it is brought down on Cornelius and his household, when Paul, or excuse me, Peter is a witness to that, to be a confirmation that the Gentiles are also heirs to the same promise that Paul talked about in chapter 3. When we are baptized, we meet Christ in the grave. We share in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's why baptism is so important. Verse 6, there's one God and Father of all. Who is over all, and through all, and in all. Now, I don't know about you guys. I can't comprehend God can't wrap my mind around a being that is in the beginning of time, at the end of time, that doesn't even know time because time is a construct of man. Time was created when God spoke into existence. The sun and the stars and the moon and days and time were created. We have a God that is so mighty and so powerful that he can speak into existence things. That he is in nature, that he is in this building, he is in us. He indwells everything. He is omnipresent, omniscious. All these big fancy words to, to tell us that we don't even understand a fraction of how incredible our God is. We are given in scripture glimpses of how powerful and how mighty our God is. But man cannot wrap his finite mind around an immortal. He's over all, through all, and in all. And in all of that, he cared enough to call you to live a life 
worthy of that calling. I mentioned that I wanted to start our discussion on the church. As I mentioned, Ephesians speaks the most about the church. Next week, we're going to go into the gifts that God gave to members of the church, to, to the body of the church, in order to build it up. But I wanted to start today with unity, with the things that unite us and bind us together. Now, all of those ones, the seven ones, are held together by peace. If we don't have peace, we don't have unity. And we are not united in those things. <clears throat> now, I want to make clear, it doesn't mean that we agree on everything. We don't have to. Paul makes mention of that. It's okay that we have different thoughts. But there are certain things that bind us and hold us together. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Those things unite us. And the peace is what binds us together. As we begin to look at the church, I want to encourage and remind you that you are saints. Did you know that? We don't often use that word, but we read it all the time in Scripture. Go back to chapter 1. <coughs> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus. A saint is one that is sanctified, one that is set apart. Folks, if you are in the body of Christ, if you are a member of Christ's church, then you are a saint. The word has been turned, and now when we say saint, we think about, you know, old guys who have been... Uh, do these miracles and all these things that we see from the Catholic Church. That word's been robbed from us in a sense. You are saints. You are sanctified. You are set apart to live that life which is worthy of the calling, held together by the bounds or the bonds of peace. So I want to encourage you this week that as we start looking at the church, that first off, That we don't speak ill of the church. Because the church is Christ's bride. We are members of the church. We are its pieces and parts. Its cells, its ligaments, its arms, its hands, its eyes. We ought to work together. Under the lordship and headship of Christ. Christ himself spoke highly of the church. In chapter 5, he talks about washing her, preparing her, lifting her up. If we are the sanctified saints, members of the body, Christ is washing us with his word. Christ is preparing us as his bride, and he is the bridegroom. The imagery is that we will be presented to him. We ought to be preparing ourselves for that. Jesus speaks in his parables about being ready, about the servants making sure that they're ready at the door, having their lamps full of oil, all of these, this imagery and these parables about being prepared and, and being ready. Folks, the church is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Most of you have been in the church for a long time. I can tell by your hair color. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, Terry, yeah. Terry doesn't have any hair. <laughs> But I want to encourage you, I want to remind you today, today's, my, my, my point on today is just to remind you of how glorious the church is, how incredible the church is, and that means how incredible you are, because you make up the church, we are the church. 
And so this week, I want you to be encouraged, and I want you to start reading through Ephesians. I want you to start at the beginning, and I want you to read it to the end. It's only six chapters. It won't take you more than maybe half hour. Break it up into sections if you want to. But I encourage you to read it at least once in its entirety. Read from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 6, verse... I forget what it is at. 24. Well, that was Ephesians. Let me go back. Oh yeah, that's 24. Okay. I want you to read through it because I want you to get the picture that Paul is giving to us of the church. Now remember, the first three chapters are the doctrinal. The last three chapters are the exhortation. How we ought to live. What we do with what he tells us in chapters 1 through 3. I want to encourage you to read that. To be prepared. Because next week we're going to continue... In verse 7 and following, we're going to start looking at the gifts which God has given to the church in order that it may be built up. Because every single one of you has gifts. Gifts that were given to you by God, by the Spirit and the indwelling, for the building up of the church. I want to encourage you that ministry ministers, servant, deacon, it's all the exact same word. In the Greek, there's no difference. It's servant. It's how we use it. So in other words, we create these walls of minister and ministries where there isn't one. We are all ministers. We are all servants. We are all called to live a life worthy of the call. Amen. Let's stand. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me.
did for all of us. Thank you for that. Thank you that we are sons and daughters of yours because of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray.